going to move from a resilience to a natural brilliant state. We're all here to move our Black communities forward. We think our children have to have the best. It's all about discipline. How are we going to discipline ourselves so that we're able to save, so that we're able to make good financial decisions? Recognizing that there's a road ahead if you manage the road in front of you. The decisions that you're going to be making today in your lives where it comes to money will affect you in the future. Discipline is one of the things that we often learn sometimes by our environment or sometimes we're, we're forced to do it and sometimes we don't learn it at all. Story want to get us in and out and get our money and that's it. it, it it's a game. So you have to be really wise to the game. Do you know what it costs to run your home on a monthly basis? Land acknowledgement. As we gather together, we acknowledge the sacred land on which we reside. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of Dish with One Spoon Wampoon Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, this gathering place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Last but certainly not least, we acknowledge the people of African descent who were brought here against their own will or in search of a safe place to live their lives and raise their children. Reconnaissance des terres. En nous rassemblant, nous reconnaissons la terre sacrée sur laquelle nous résidons. C'est un site d'activité humaine depuis 15 000 ans. Cette terre est le territoire des Premières Nations, Huron, Wandat et Petun, les Séniques et plus récemment les Mississauga de la Crédit, de la rivière Crédit. Le territoire était sujet de l'alliance de la ceinture Wampun plat avec cuillère, une accord entre la Confédération Iroquois et Confédération des Ojibwe et des nations alliées à partager et à prendre soin pacifiquement pour les ressources autour des Grands Lacs. Aujourd'hui, ce lieu de rassemblement est toujours le foyer de nombreux peuples autochtones de toute l'île de la Tortue et Nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir la possibilité de travailler dans la communauté sur ce territoire. Nous sommes également conscients des alliances brisées et de la nécessité de nous efforcer de guérir toutes nos relations. Dernier point, mais non le moindre, nous remercions les personnes d'ascendance africaine qui ont été amenées ici contre leur volonté ou à la recherche d'un endroit sûr où vivre leur vie et élever leurs enfants. This webinar provides illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Black Business and Professional Association. The BBPA makes no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein, and especially this claim all liability for any damages arising out of the use or reference to or lines on such material. It's a beautiful morning. Get up, get up, get up. Don't forget right now, community space, tell a friend to tell a friend. We are here live in this space and we're talking financial literacy. It is the end. We're actually wrapping up financial literacy month. So we're going out with definitely a bang. And our quote for today, having a good discussion is like having riches. And here on community space, we are definitely wealthy in terms of dialogue and conversation, building our way to intergenerational wealth. And also the last quote for the day, and this is from the Akan people. Wisdom is not like money to be tied up and hidden. 
And we always say what happens here on community space, we want you to take out and reverberate into the community. Good morning, I'm your host, Roderick Brereton, and it is another episode of Community Space. We've got an amazing, amazing episode for you here this morning. And um, it's not too late to tell a friend, to tell a friend to join us right here on Community Space. And our guest this morning um, is somebody who is definitely within financial literacy and enabling and empowering our community to get um, more into understanding money and having access to money. And her name is Jean Barrett. Good morning, Jean. How are you? Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm Thanks for having Thank me out this morning. Thank you. And Jean is the manager of community microfinance programming at Alterna Savings. And she's got more than 25 years history in banking with, even though you cannot tell, it looks like she just graduated like yesterday, obviously, <laughs> uh, definitely so. Um, so she's got more than 25 years in banking with retail and, and commercial experience. And she is also the manager at Alterna Savings Bank. And it is a, a nationally acclaimed uh, community microfinance program. And um, she manages and oversees over nine community microloan portfolios and manages several other portfolios, um, over 250 plus small, um, um, small businesses um, in terms of the borrowing um, across GTA and on Ottawa. So there's definitely much more that we're gonna learn from Jean this morning. So Jean, how are things been going? Things been going good. I'm so happy to be here and talking to the group about financial literacy and options for financing, you know, talking about Alterna Savings, the credit union in which I work for. Um, I did start when I was five, so thank you for there you that. Go. We knew that. Uh, <laughs> and so that has led up to my 25 years working with um, Alterna um, in many, many different capacity, but now I'm, you know, running a small um, business portfolio and, and we can chat a little bit about that as we go forward. Definitely. So my, my first question, and you know, I like to ask questions. So what got you into banking? What got you into uh, money? So, money. So when I was growing up in Jamaica, I remember um, my family, we um, had a, a chicken business. We used to sell chicken. And so my mom would always ask me, she would take care of the chicken and she would always ask me, so make change, you know, take the money, give the change back. And, and that sort of led me to, you know, think, oh, I am good with money. I'm good with numbers. This is where I wanted to um uh, follow. And so when I came to Canada, um, when I was a teenager, went to school, um, and then I started working in the financial industry because I, you know, felt that sort of drive that push um, to work in the financial industry. And then I started to work in um, commercial um, lending area, doing large commercial lending real estate deals. I also transitioned down to the branch and work on the retail side as well, because I wanted to get sort of well-rounded in how, you know, I manage individual finances. And then it led me back to small business lending. And hence, I'm with the community microfinance program right now. All right, excellent. So you grew up in a household where you had um, your parents in terms of having a business and then so you yes. learn some of those fundamentals from your parents exactly just being in that environment and how important exactly. do you think that is for for people um who have children and have businesses to expose them to just how business works I think it's vitally important that parents expose their children to entrepreneurship at an early age, because maybe when we're little, we truly don't understand the, the, the ins and out of managing a business, but we get to see what our parents do and we learn from that example. And as we grow or knowledge grow, we get to understand more at different stages in our lives. And then, you know, you then as a person discover, do I have that entrepreneurial spirit? Is this the direction that I wanna go into? And then of course, you know, getting the education 
backing up everything that you have behind that entrepreneurial spirit, spirit and that allows you to achieve those goals. So I think it's really important that we expose our children, even not just to entrepreneurship, but financial literacy and education from a really young age. You know, having them have bank accounts when they're little, um, having them learn how to start saving. I think it's really important that we start teaching our kids because they grow up to, you know, become better human beings, handle money better, they become business owners, and most importantly, they pass on information, fundamentals that they've learned to their family. So the, the generation keeps learning and learning. Great point and a great segue in terms of what was your biggest takeaway when you think back to uh, growing up that your parents gave you when it came down to money or business? I think the biggest takeaway for me was my parents always encouraged me to go to school um, and learn. Um, you know, as you know, parents, sometimes your parents don't um, go further than what you've accomplished. So they, uh, parents always wanna see that their children sort of surpass them in terms of learning and having that, you know, those opportunities that life has to offer. So I think that's the greatest lesson that, you know, my parents, especially my mom sort of pushed that to learn how to go to school, get that education, and then, you know, you're open to other opportunities that, are, that arise. All right, great stuff. So yeah, we are definitely looking forward to your presentation this morning. And folks who are joining us for the first time, if you have any questions, um, there will be a time for questions, but please do use the chat and we'll be checking the chat and uh, taking your comments and questions as we go through. And also, um, if you've got questions and you would like to come on, we would definitely love to hear from you. And uh, if you can turn on your cameras, we would love to see your beautiful faces as always. All right, so Definitely. over to you, Jean. All right, great. I'm about to share my screen with everyone. So please give me a minute. I'll bring up my presentation. And here we go. All right. right. And if you're here joining us for the first time uh, while Jean is getting her presentation, please do let us know where you are checking in from. Even if you're not here for the first time, share the chat where you're checking in from. It's always great to know where we have people uh, listening and, and, and participating from. All right. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Thank you again for having me out to present. Um, today, our presentation will cover our community microfinance program, but as well, we're going to be talking about the institution or the financial institution that I work for. Um, so you get an understanding of who we are and where we're located and what we offer. We're going to also touch a little bit on credit because I think it's really important to understand credit when you're thinking of boring for your personal needs or boring for your business needs, how credit plays an important role. And then finally, we're going to end with our microfinance program. And that program highlights option financing options for small business owners. If you're looking for those seed capital financing, how you can acquire that going forward. So that's just a little bit about me. And I think Roderick talked a little bit about my bio. So I will just skip over that. Um, so I just want to say welcome to everyone. Um, Alterna Savings is a financial institution, a financial cooperative, also known as a credit union. We operate in the province of Ontario since 1908. Um, so we've been around for over 114 years. At the credit union, banking means having everything you need um, to enable you to manage and achieve your financial goals. So we're here to provide you with those tools, um, those services, those advice to help you get to that financial goal destination. At the credit union, the way to bank, you have a completely different experience. We um, have about 47 branches located here in Ontario. 12 of those branches are in the greater Toronto region and the branches are spread out right across the province. So we have branches in Ottawa, um, Peterborough, Thunder Bay and Southwestern Ontario. 
We have $10 billion in assets on the management with over 217,000 members. That includes personal members, business members, non-for-profit and organization accounts. When you decide to join or become a member of Alternative Savings, there is a one-time membership share fee that individuals um, would get started. It's $15 if you wanted to open up an account to become a member at Alterna. So as a financial cooperative, our profits serve a higher purpose. Um, we reinvest back our profits back into our community in terms of grants, sponsorship and donations. We are member owned and operated. So you as the member have ownership. We provide great interest rates, even though we're in a low interest rate environment right now, but our interest rates are very compatible or comparable and competitive with other financial institution. We also um, ensure that our staff provide our members with good, sound, and honest financial advice because we care about your financial needs and ensuring that you make the best financial decision for yourself and for your family. And as a credit union, we have your back. No matter what your financial situation is, we're able to sit down with you and have that conversation so we can ensure that we create the right financial services and product that suit your need. And we have our community microfinance program, which I will be talking a little bit later on, um, how that can provide options to entrepreneurship. And we do have a specialized community product offering for so those accounts, individuals who are opening non-for-profit, cooperative, charitable accounts, we do offer specialized banking products there as well. So some of the um, products and services that you would find at Alterna, checking and savings account, mortgages and loans. We do a non-for-profit organization banking package. We do do retirement and investment planning. We also have our commercial area that does small and large commercial um, deals. We do savings and investment. We do have a wealth management area that deals with stocks, bonds, mutual funds. So we have financial advice there that can support um, individuals who are looking to go in that direction. And we do also have Alterna Bank, which is our digital bank. So we have customers who want to open up their account and they can do that right across the province, right across the country of Canada and have a bank account with Alterna. So some of the products and services here that is listed, that is shown in our branches um, and which um, our members can access through their mobile um, phones, online banking as well. So those checking and those savings accounts, um, we do reg registered products as well. So tax-free savings account, registered educational savings plan. So individuals who wanna start saving um, for their children's um, post-secondary education can open up those accounts. We have registered retirement saving plans. So individuals who wanna start saving for their retirement, can do that as well. And then the reg registered retirement income fund and those, um, the registered retirement income fund is those individuals who are now past the age of retirement and now their RRSP has been converted over into an income fund and they'll start getting income from that because now they're in um, the, the life stage where they're no longer working and then now they're getting income from those uh, savings. We do offer credit products both on the business side and the personal side, so credit cards, loans, lines of credit, and mortgages. I also want to state that all accounts and deposits at Alterna Savings is insured up to two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars for our, you know, credit um, for deposit products. Um, so. We are very secured as a financial institution and the funds that are deposited um, in us in our credit union is very secured and people don't have to feel worried that they're going to lose um, their dollars because we you know, are regulated by the province and by the Banking Act of Canada. So when considering opening up a bank account with alternative savings, you know, think of 
where you would like to open up your account, what is required. You will need to have two pieces of identification and those would be government issued identification. You would also have to provide your social insurance number if you're thinking of borrowing as well and a credit check or a credit um, report will be performed on the account opening process. Now, when you're thinking of looking at Alterna, we do have about 12 to 13 branches located in um, the greater Toronto region. So our branches are open from Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, you can certainly find that information on our website at alterna.ca to um, show you the location and the hours of our operation. You're also going to want to think about the banking um, packages that are associated with the types of accounts that you're thinking of you're going to open. And then you, you probably want to think about accounts that pay you interest. So accounts that you want to invest in, what are those interest rates? Are they compounded? Um, and how do you earn um, money on top of the investment that you're going to um, open? So those are some of the considerations that you can think about um, for Alterna. We do offer online banking services, mobile banking services. So you will have access to your account seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So we're very interactive um, and we have the technology to support those activities. Now- so we got one yes, quick question before, here. Someone asked if they can open account an account if they're located in Quebec. Unfortunately, no. Um, for alternative savings, you would have to live in the province of Ontario in order to open up an account. Um, I do know we do have our Alterna bank and you can open up an online account on the bank no matter where you live in Canada. So with the credit union, no, but with the bank, yes. All right, thank you. Any more questions before I move ahead? So I wanted to talk a little bit about your credit because I wanted to sort of um, go over this a little bit before I get into the, the finding, financing piece. Um, so you understand how credit works and how important it is to have that sort of basic understanding of what financial institution, what lenders look at when they're looking at your personal credit information. Your personal credit information plays an important role whether you wanna borrow for personal needs or whether you wanna borrow for business needs. There are two reporting credit agencies in Canada, which are independent from all financial institution. There's Equifax and there's TransUnion. And most of the time, um, individuals, when they're borrowing credit, will give the banks or um, credit card companies access to look at their personal credit information. So there's a number of things that impact your overall credit scores, which is also known as your Beacon score or your FICO score. We call it your credit score. There are six key things. Number one is the time and history of your payments. So ensuring that your payments, if you have any outstanding loans, any credit card debts, that these are paid on a timely basis. So in most instances, um, the companies will say your payment date may be beyond the 1st, the 15th, or the 30th of the month. You ensure that you're making that payment on time, which will build up your payment history. And that information gets reported on your credit report. Number two is any record of bankruptcy. And bankruptcy is if someone has declared bankruptcy, meaning that they're unable to pay all their um, financial obligations um, and they would have to declare bankruptcy. And bankruptcy will sit on an individual credit report for seven years. That information gets reported on your credit report and lenders will have access to see that information. Number three is any outstanding debts. So any debts that you may have, maybe loan, you might be carrying a balance, your credit cards might have a balance, that information is shown on your credit report. 
Number four is the number of credit scores inquiry, meaning that each time you a person decides to go out to look for credit, what's um, an inquiry is performed. So you want to ensure that the number of inquiries is kept at a really low amount. Number five is the types of credit. There are two main types of credit out there. There's what's called a revolving credit and what's called an installment credit. A revolving credit, examples of those are credit cards and lines of credit, meaning once an individual applies for them, you've approved, you now have access to use those um, types of credit, you will then use it, you will pay it off, you will use it, you will pay it off, meanings revolving. Once you get approved for it, you no longer have to reapply. And then there's the installment um, credit. An installment credit, examples of those are personal loans, car loans, student loans, meaning that you borrow a fixed amount there's a fixed interest rate, there is a fixed monthly payment, and there is an end date to when that loan will be paid off. And those are the two main types of credit that get reports on someone's credit report. And finally, items in collection. Items in collection, if an individual has that reported on their credit report, meaning that a person doesn't pay their credit facility, it then goes over to a collection agency. The collection agency will then report that on your credit file and that information will have a negative impact on your overall credit scores. A person can lose anywhere from 50 up to 150 points off your credit score. The average credit score out there is 700. So an individual should maintain a credit score in the 700 range. Credit scores ranges anywhere from 300 to 900. Most financial institutions have a benchmark that they look at at a guideline at from the alternate perspective. We look at credit scores ranging from 650 and upwards. But ideally, if you want to be a good candidate for institution, banks, credit unions to lend to you, your credit score should be in the 700 range. All right. Quick uh, question yeah. here, um, Jean. So often, you know, we, we may hear on the radio or, or see in some type of uh, media, you know, fix your credit, you know, we'll fix your credit for $299 and, and along mm -hmm. those lines. And and then obviously they often target um, communities like ours where, you know, quote unquote, there's a, uh, a stereotype of us not having good credit. Mm -hmm. Is there any legitimacy to those type of those ads that they say that they can fix your credit? I've seen them a lot and I'm, they're mostly third party organization and you have to be very sort of wary you have to do your due diligence who you're going to get to fix your credit report um there are great organizations out there that can help you there's credit counseling canada um, they are an organization that offer free service to help individuals fix their credit report they're a subdivision of the government so information that you share with them have to be private and confidential and their whole purpose is there to help to support you to get that credit counseling that you need to help ensure that you can fix your overall credit report. There are agencies out there that says, yes, we can fix your report for a fee. Um, maybe because I work in a financial institution, I'm, I'm pretty very much sort of cautious about who looks at my credit report um, because you don't know at the back end who's going to be looking at your information or sharing your information. And sometimes your information is very private and confidential and you wanna ensure that you're working with a, a company that is going to be private and confidential and work in the best effort to help you to fix your report. However, there's um, people tend to use these companies and organization great if it works great for them but you know i would be very cautious so there is no magic wand that this can you know if you've got you know 500 um 
if you've got 500 uh, credit rating credit score mm -hmm. uh, and that, that could bring you up to like 700 in you know, yeah there's no there's no magic wand the work is really um work that has to be done you know roll up your sleeves get in there um I always recommend if you have low credit scores and they're outstanding debts that you have to pay for, look for the lowest debt that you have, pay it off. And then you move to the next one, pay it off. Then you move up to the next one, you pay it off. And that way, when you work on paying off the smallest debt and then you move to the next one, you have an opportunity to help rebound your overall credit scores. But it does require some work from the individual who requires to um, you know, help reestablish their credit score and rebuild back their credit. It does take a little bit of work on their part. So, and, and the Credit Counseling Agency of Canada will advise individuals of that too. You know, they will come up with a, a, um, a, a guide for the individual and say, which debt can we tackle first? You know, we can pay this off and then we can move to the next one and we can pay that off. Um, and most creditors will want to see that. Um, there's, there's, um, a process that you could do, which is called a settlement process. If you have items in collection, you can go to the creditor and goes, I would, I like to settle the, this debt. I don't have the $50 that I owe, but I can settle this debt for a lower amount. The creditor can take that because they're getting money in to pay that debt off. And rather than taking the full amount, they will take a partial amount to settle that debt. And once the debt is settled and it's paid, they will report that information on your credit file and it will help to improve your overall credit scores. So there's different sort of tools and avenues that you can utilize in order to take steps to get, you know, to resolve issues on your credit. Right. So when, for instance, something is paid off, um, how soon does that impact your credit score in terms of yeah. improving it? Great question. So when an item on your credit is paid off. Sometimes it will take three months. Sometimes it will take six months. Um, it's up to the creditor to report the information has been paid. And then when it reports the information has been paid, um, the credit agency will ensure that that information is um, factual, it's accurate, and it gets reported consistently that it's paid and then it will help to improve. So we'll, you know, in, in my experience, I've seen in three months time, an item is paid, it's improved. Their scores start going up. So, you know, it all depends on the time, you know, the how much person owes, how much they paid off the debt, when they paid the debt off, um, and when the creditor reports the information in. So it takes a number of things, but it will start reporting on a positive um, basis. And uh, just a quick other question, and hopefully I'm not uh, jumping anything here. So in our community, there's a, a stereotype um, that we have poor credit. I think that's pretty generalized right across the board. Mm -hmm. How do we get into these positions of having poor credit uh, and what is the usual suspect that gets us into having poor credit? So I want to start card? off that. Sorry? I want to start off that life happens, right? Mm -hmm. Every day we go through life. Um, things happen. We have we probably get access to credit, and sometimes without the the financial literacy and the financial education around how we how we manage credit responsibly, we're not aware. And we sort of get into um, situations where we don't manage our credit well and we're into that position. And I, I always like to use an example of, you know, when you're a young person, you just went off to college or university, you're now on your own, you're making decisions on your own, um, and credit card um, companies are on campus. You can apply by yourself. You use the credit and you don't realize throughout your life period or your life stages that how you manage the credit when you're really young follows you into adult years. And then you want to get married. You want to, you know, have a family. You want to purchase a home. 
right? And then you realize, oh, this credit situation that I had when I was 18, 19 followed me here. Um, so, you know, life happens. And I think providing the tools to um, individuals when they're really early to help them to understand how to manage credit and how credit will play an important role um, helps them to build that awareness, that knowledge and that understanding of managing credit. So having the tools at an early age will certainly help. But you know, life happens. Um, sometimes people have divorces. Uh, people um, have emergencies, there's a death in the family, you know, people lose their jobs, and sometimes have access to credit, we utilize that because it's the easiest thing to do at that point in time. But we have to keep in mind that, you know, it's reported, it's tracked, and we do have to repay that back. So always, you know, have an understanding that be responsible, make your payments, even if you're making the minimum payments, you're still making a payment, it is reported, and it will help you not to be in the position where you're at the stage where, you know, it's reported that you have bad credit. But life happens to all of us, right? We just don't know when it's going to happen, but it's how we manage credit going forward from there. Correct. And Ed, I like that you mentioned that uh, often, you know, when, when young people are getting into post-secondary school... Um, you know, the credit card companies are there and say, hey, here's your first credit card. And, uh, you know, but they obviously give you that quote unquote access to having credit and, you know, but they're not telling you how to pay it off. So I think parents exactly. definitely have a responsibility for when their children do have that credit card to explain ex exactly what you have just um, talked exactly. about. Exactly. And, and, um, also, and I think. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I also think, you know, start teaching financial literacy in schools. Okay that really helps, right? Definitely uh, so. Because I've seen in cases where if financial literacy is taught in school, sometimes the kids take that back and, and tell their parents about this, right? So, you know, I think if we start teaching that at a really early age, um, you know, we are smart individuals and we're gonna get that information and we're gonna put it to use, we're gonna apply it. And so that you know, will help us to make better decisions when it comes to money, when it comes to credit and so forth. I think there's a hand up. Yes, there is a hand up. Good morning, Adia, how are you? Great, thank you, Roderick, how are you today? So far, so good, blessed and highly favored as they say. <laughs> I just wanted to add another comment to Jean because I, I and, and your comment about credit cards um, and we were using the example of young people, but I think it's also important for everyone to actually read the terms mm -hmm. of their credit cards and understand them um, because people sometimes don't realize your credit cards can get canceled if you don't use them or your interest rate can go up quite a bit more if you happen to do a late payment or miss your payment on your credit cards. So um, it's really important that you do look at that information and understand what terms you have for each credit card that you have. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. And if you don't understand the terms, speak with someone, speak with the person, ask the question, right? Because they're like, it's in the fine print, but you have to definitely ask those questions. What are the terms? What are my obligations? What will happen if this scenario happens? Will the interest rate go up? What fees do I have to pay? So you have to understand the terms and conditions that are outlined to you. Um, and if you don't ask questions, um, they're there to give you those answers um, so you can sort of make better decisions going forward. So I totally agree. Yeah, and something I just recently learned is that um, you can also talk to the, 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 the institution that you're gonna be getting a credit card from and often negotiate a, a lower interest rate um, if, if they're open to doing something along those lines. So um, it, it may not be your, you know, your, collect your points on, you know, everything that you're, you're spending on, but there are lower interest rate credit cards that are available. And also, if you're going to be um, knowing that you're going to have to miss a payment and it has, it may come a little bit later, you can talk to your institution and let them know so that their, you know, arrangements will be made. Mm -hmm. 
that they, they know that uh, that payment will be coming in later or maybe it's a part of a payment and apparently it can have um, not as a detrimental effect on that credit card or that. Yeah. that and, and most credit, most companies offer credit cards, they start at low to no fee all the way to the higher perks credit cards. So sometimes you don't really need the bells and whistle when you're applying for a credit card. You might want to start out with a low fee credit card, but the interest rate is a lot lower. Um, another thing to think about is the limit that you're applying for. Maybe you don't need that five ten thousand dollars limit. Maybe you need a lower limit, $5,000, um, $1,000, uh, a limit that you can manage. If you use it, you know you have the ability, the capacity to pay within that limit. Because sometimes I, I do see where, you know, we get the higher limits and because we have the higher limit, we use it. But some we know that that limit has to be repaid. So thinking about having a lower limit also plays um, an important role. So just wanted to um, move a little bit, a little ahead. Um, an individual can improve their credit report by five key things. So your payment history, so making those payments on time. So whether, as you know, when you get your statement every month, it tells you that you have a payment date, keeping that payment history in place or consistent really helps to improve your overall credit scores. Every 30 days, all banks, credit card companies and lenders report into Equifax and TransUnion your credit um, payment history. And that is applied to your file. So, you know, you have to keep your, um, your payment history in a timely basis. And then there's use of available credit. So use of available credit, meaning that, you know, you have a credit card for $1,000, um, that is the limit. Um, but you don't want to use $999 because then you're at the maximum of your, your credit card limit. And then perhaps fees are charged on top of that, interest is charged on that, and then you've exceeded your credit limit, your available credit that is allocated to you. The rule of thumb is to use anywhere between 40 to 50% of your available credit. That way we see that our lenders will see that, you know, you have some capacity that you've not exceeded your credit. There is some room. You're not using all the available um, limit that you have and that you're able to consistently make those payments to um, cover the available um, credit that you've used. We also look at the length of credit history. So how long you've had your credit file open, how long you've had a particular credit card or a loan active that um, generates or form parts of your credit history. We do know that sometimes if someone is new to Canada, they don't have a length of credit history. Their file might be open for six months, maybe a year, it's not open that long. So they don't have time to build up that credit history um, that um, most lenders will look at. But it's really important to lenders that we see, you know, how responsible a person is in managing their credit, you know, how long they've had a credit card, how well they've used it, um, and that plays a really important role. Then the number of inquiries, and this one is really important because, you know, we have five big banks in Canada. We have credit unions, um, we have private lenders, we have department stores. So each time an individual goes out looking for a product and service, um, those um, companies or institution will perform uh, a credit check. And in order for them to perform a credit check, the individual would have to give consent. And consent comes in two form. You can give a verbal consent, IG, give consent, or you do a written consent where you sign that credit application, you sign that credit agreement. Um, that allows the credit, the creditor to perform a credit check. And you wanna keep those inquiries really low. That information is reported 
on a person's credit report. And each time an inquiry is performed, the individual lose about 10 points off their personal credit scores. So you wanna keep that really down. So I always like to use the example of, if you your credit score is at 700, you went to the five big banks, you went to two credit unions, including Alterna, within a month, we all, perform a credit check, you can lose anywhere from 70 points off your credit score. So now if you are sitting at 700 with all those inquiries performed, you now fall down to 630. So you have to keep that in mind. Keep your inquiries really low. Identify that you need a product and service or a service um, do your homework, do your research, ensure that you want to go with this company or bank or credit union. This is where I want to go. You've looked at those products and services. You now know that this is what I want to do. Then you go out and see that product and service. And then only one um, inquiry will be performed. And then finally, the types of credit. In my experience, I see that uh, a lot of individuals have just the revolving credit on their credit report. You know, the rule of thumb is to have a mixture, have a blend between revolving credit and installment credit. Do not be too heavily weighted in one type of credit over the other. Having a nice mixture, so for example, having one or two credit cards, you might have a student loan or you might have a personal loan or a car loan. That's a good blend or mixture of having those two types of um, credit that's reported on your credit report. And that will help you to improve your overall credit score and your credit um, history. So, All right. Uh, just before we get to that next slide, uh, a quick question here and from the chat. So how long does that credit inquiry stay on your um, credit report? It stays on your report for a really long time. I've seen um, through Equifax, maybe every three to four years based on, on a year, on a chronological basis or on a yearly basis, they will um, fall off and the newest ones go on top. But I've seen um, inquiries um, four or five years, on, sometimes on individual credit report. Um, it will sit on the report. There is an actual section that will show all the inquiries that is performed on an individual. It shows us the date, um, the organization or the company that's performing the credit check and their phone number. So we know on a particular date when we look at a person's credit report that they've gone to RBC, that they've gone to um, Alterna um, and a credit check was performed. Right. So we'll see that information. And I, I believe there's a way that you can look yourself as an individual yes. that um, does, or maybe that's what you're gonna get into Yeah, now. that's what I was gonna all get right, into. All right, all right, no so I'm not gonna be a spoiler, yeah, definitely so not. You know, every individual has an opportunity to look at their own credit history, their own credit report for free, um, and your scores are not impacted at all. So you can go to either Equifax or TransUnion, um, look at your own, uh, um, have access to your own credit information. We don't even know that you've gone in to look at your credit report as lenders, because you can look at that information. Um, you could go to Equifax.ca or TransUnion.com online, get access to your own information. They will either mail you out your credit report. If you wanted to see your credit scores, I do believe they have a fee. There's a charge that they will charge for you to see your credit report. Um, scores, but if you just want to see the information that is reported in your credit report, you can get that for free. I do believe, I remember, and I don't know if they're open back, but because of the pandemic, Equifax used to have a physical location at Finch and Young, so 5650 Young Street. Um, person could walk in with their IDs and so forth and get access to their own credit um, report for free. Um, I think Audia yeah. have her hand up. Yeah, Audia, go ahead. Audia, sorry. Go ahead. 
Hi, sorry about that. Okay, so you can get the all of your credit information once a year, um, but they don't advertise it on the website. They encourage you to pay the fee, but you can actually call and get the information about how to get it for free. And yes, they certainly do. Yeah, they do. But um, yeah. if you look at it on the website, um, it mostly leads you to paying for the information and you don't need to. Mm -hmm. But most people want to see their credit scores. Um, I think that's really important because they want to know where they're at when they're looking to go out to get funding. Um, so most people I've noticed want to see their credit scores. And so they'll pay that fee. I do know that there are a few banks, not Alterna, but there are banks out there that provide um, a service where you pay your monthly banking um, fees. And part of that is you get to see your credit scores on a monthly basis. Um, so that is available to individuals as well, but certainly you know, through those organizations, Equifax or TransUnion, you have the opportunity of getting your own personal credit report for free. That does not include your credit scores, but if you wanted to get the credit scores, they do charge that fee. So it's really important that you look at your information because you want to ensure the information that is reported on there is actual, is um, accurate, um, everything is factual as well. So, you know, hygiene, you know, make sure that I have my credit cards on there, whatever loans. I'm the one who borrowed that um, credit facility um, on there that nothing is showing on there that is not accurate nor um, correct. And ensuring that nobody use um, your identity to borrow under your name, you know, you can see the information that is there. So when you're sitting down dealing with a lender, you can have, you know, a great sort of conversation and can be your own advocate when you're getting any sort of credit products and so forth. And that's a, a great point, Jean. How do you dispute anything with TransUnion or Equifax? Uh, I know um, myself um, when I was looking to, I, I believe it was a mortgage and I, I saw something on my credit that I'd paid off like three, four years ago. Right. And it was still on my credit that it, it was still outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, I had to go through bells and whistles. I'm mean, sorry. I had to go through like hoops mm -hmm. um, that were fixed. But like, how yeah. does the average person dispute something that is maybe not accurate on that credit score? Right. Great question. So number one, first, you got to get that credit report see the information there. So if you were disputing, and I'm just going to use, say, Rogers as an example. So if you were disputing something that was on your credit report that you've paid, paid for three, four years ago, um, and you notice that it's still reporting on your information, what you would need to do is if you've paid that item off, go back to your receipts. Your receipts are your proof that you've paid it off. You then, with the evidence that you have, you get in contact with the creditor. You get in contact with Rogers or whatever. I have my proof that I've paid this off. Um, and you can just call their customer service line. They will put you through to their um, the department that handles um, billings and payments. Um, and then say, here's the evidence that I have. This is being reported on my um, credit report that is not being paid. I have proof that I've paid this off. They will ask you to send them the proof. Once they have the proof, they then have to then report it through to Equifax that you've paid um, that debt. The key thing is to have evidence and proof that you've made that payment because that is your line of defense. And so to ensure that you have the evidence, then the creditor, it's their responsibility to report that information on your credit file. So then it gets you know, um, uploaded on your credit file and show that it's paid. But I, I, I totally understand you, Rod, you have to go through hoops because then now the onus is off you to show um, burden of proof that you've made the payment. Um, and then now it's the creditor responsibility to report that this item has been paid. 
Yeah, it was uh, not an easy task, but it, uh, it, it's it's not an easy task. It's a it's a little bit of work to do, um, because you know they're not going to do this for you. You have to be the person to show that you have evidence that this debt was paid, um, and it's their you know they're the one who made the error, and they would then have to go in and fix it. Right. And then obviously the consequences of not doing it means that you're going to be paying a higher interest rate on your mortgage or on your vehicle yeah. or whatever that you're going to be borrowing because obviously, as you said, rightfully so, when you know the the credit unions or the banks are looking at your scores, and you know, lo and behold, you you know got uh, an error on that, they're not going to recognize it, and then, you know that percentage in terms of interest could be astronomical right it could be exactly either a, a, you know a, a loan that you're getting at a, a good rate or something that you know that you're paying you know 13 15 even 19 percent mm -hmm. on you know a, a, a car loan or something along those lines definitely it makes a huge difference and the worst thing is it will sit on your report if it doesn't get fixed the longer it sits on your report the longer it will have an impact on your credit um, score. So you want to get it fixed. You want it, it showed that this account is paid. Um, and so it can, um, you know, report the proper reporting for you. I believe there's a hand up from Juliet. Yes. Good morning, Juliet. Bonjour. How are you? A uh, blessed good morning. How are you? Fine. Thank you, guys. Um, hello, good. Jean. Pleasure. Hello. Um, Question: uh, From the financial perspective, um, when you when they do an inquiry on your credit bureau, how long? How does that impact you if you if it, it's um, they say no and you go to somebody else? How does that impact you for coming to you per se? And um, and the other thing, the other part of the question is, what's the acceptable inquiry on a credit bureau? So I'll answer the last piece first. An acceptable inquiry is maybe two inquiries, two to three inquiries per month or on a quarterly basis. Um, you know, most of the times people are not every month looking for credit unless they're buying big ticket items. For example, purchasing a car, you know, getting a mortgage, loans or whatever. So normally, two to three inquiries a month, ideal, or on a, on a quarterly basis. It shouldn't be a lot of inquiries being performed. Now, when you go from institution to institution, and each institution it wants to perform an inquiry on you based on whatever product or service you're looking for, the lender will see that, um, there's an inquiry performed from a previous institution and they perhaps might ask, oh, I noticed you were at RBC. Um, what were you there for? Were you boring? Were you there looking for a mortgage or a loan? The lender will inquire about that. Now, if the product is different, um, great. If the product is the same, the lender will ask, well, why didn't you not get the, what did they say that you didn't get the uh, the loan or the product or service at that different institution? What was the reason they've given? Um, and the lender will then look at other different factors in order to make a decision to extend credit to that individual. So, you know, what I always like to recommend is if you're looking for a product and service, have a conversation with the banks or the companies first. Say, A, I'm looking to get a credit card. What is your, what type of credit cards do you offer? What is the interest rate? What are the fees um, associated with that? When do you think, you know, how much money of an income do I need to have to apply for this credit? Have the conversation. We're there to give you that information. We're there to you know, guide you and say, okay, this is the minimum income requirement that you need to have. This is the type of credit cards that we offer. Here's the interest rate. 
then you can then go ahead and make that decision. Do I want to go ahead and, and, and borrow now? Or do I need to really think about this? Now, am I in the space where I can borrow? You know, maybe my income is not at the income requirement that they're looking for. Maybe I need to, you know, get a, a promotion at work. Whatever the case might be, you need to do research before applying for credit. Because when you have a conversation, a conversation should not lead to an inquiry being performed because we're just talking. Once it, once it reached to the point where I need to fill out a loan application, I need to sign a credit agreement, that's where the inquiry comes into play. So have the conversation first, do your research, ask questions, get information so you can then make an informed decision. And do, so you, have to give, do you have to give the, um, the institution authority to, um, to, to give? Yeah, you gotta to give that. consent. Consent, yes, yeah, right, yes. You gotta yeah. give consent and consent comes in two form, written consent, so you sign that loan application agreement or you give verbal consent. I, Jean, give consent first, you know, whomever to look at my credit report. Most banks, most credit card companies, you sign. You give, you sign an application form. Um, services like if you're, so for example, when I was moving from one location to the next, I wanted to get my internet and my cable um, sort of cut, cut off at one home and re, um, re uh, updated at another home, right? And when I call Rogers that I'm moving from one location to the next, that I want them to you know, discontinue my service here and hook up my new service at my new home, I gave them verbal consent over the phone. So, you know, they're like, okay, in order for do, us to do this, you need to give us consent. I says, okay, I, Jean, give consent. And then on the phone with me, they did their checks. They came back, okay, great, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you have to look out for that. Um, in my experience, a lot of people says, well, nobody told me that I've given consent. All banks, all companies and organization that perform credit check have to notify you that they're going to perform a credit check, meaning that they have to ask for your consent in order to do so. They have to let you know. They just cannot perform a credit check without your knowledge. All right. Great information. All right. So we're going to move into the final piece, um, which is, you know, I'm hopefully that we cover the, the credit piece because the credit piece plays an important role when an entrepreneur is starting up their business. They are the sole owner for their company. Um, and if they're thinking of borrowing their credit, their personal credit is going to play an important role. So understanding what lenders look at when an individual is starting their business um, is really sort of key. Our community microfinance program look at individuals who are, you know, looking for that, you know, starting um, their startup capital, that working capital, that seed capital to start and launch their business. And we provide um, small uh, business loan to help to support entrepreneurs. So our community microfinance program has been around since June 2000, providing um, loans and full financial services um, to individuals or entrepreneurs. And we typically see individuals who are unable or entrepreneurs who are unable to get traditional financing for their business if they're looking for that startup capital to help their business, you know, get up off the ground and start running. So our primary focus, we look at underserved individuals and organization, low income individuals, self-employed, business that are in the startup phase, newcomer to Canada, and individuals who are transitioning uh, to the workforce if they're looking for financing. We have five targeted groups that we lend to. So our low income earners, skills and professional trades, social entrepreneur and enterprise, 
women entrepreneurs, and we do a professional development loan as well. So since our microfinance program has started, we've loaned over $7 million in small business loans to over 1,300 entrepreneurs. So our portfolio are made up of over 1,300 entrepreneurs who have borrowed for us for um, their small business. So the next slides is going to show the different requirements that we look for when someone or, or an entrepreneur is submitting an application for our microloan program. So the first one is our income builder loans. And this loan is for individuals who are looking to supplement or bridge the income gap between self-employment. So someone who's working but has a business that they're also running. So they wanna be employed and self-employed at the same time. So you know we um, can lend to those individuals, to do those entrepreneurs. The loan amounts here ranges from a thousand up to $5,000 to qualify individuals um, would need to be 18 years or older, um, be a legal resident of Canada, live in the province of Ontario, um, work and live within the Alterna um, service area, would have to show a personal income and assets under 30,000. They will need to operate a full-time, part-time seasonal or legal business. And what we need for them when they're applying um, for this program, they would need to have a business plan or an executive summary, 12 months cash flow projections, most recent notice of assessment from CRA, um, proof of income, references, six months bank statement, photo identification, also what's not listed here, any business registration that they have. So they've decided to register their business. We would need to see documentation of that. And the reason why we ask for the notice of assessment are two key things. We want to ensure that the individual meets the income requirement here for this program. So we look at income under the 30 thousand mark and your notice of assessment will show evidence and proof of that. And also we want to ensure that the entrepreneur um, doesn't owe taxes. Now, if an individual owe taxes, what we will ask for that they have a payment plan or payment arrangement with CCRA in place. And we want to see six consecutive payment history on their taxes. Now, if an individual or an entrepreneur owes the government taxes here, um, by law, we are unable to um, lend to them because the government takes precedence all over all loans. So we want to ensure that the individual, the entrepreneur is in good standing with the government as well. Number two is our skill and professional and trade loans. And these loans are to individual that has a skill, have a trade, maybe have completed an apprenticeship program or completed an entrepreneurship program through a college, university, or a business, um, uh, business uh, development center. So, you know, examples of that is if an individual is a plumber, they're in the construction field, there might be a bookkeeper, para paralegal, they could be an IT consultant. So they have a skill in trade that they're going into business with. So they can borrow anywhere from a thousand up to $15,000 for this particular program, would need to be 18 years or older. Credit scores here of 650 and above. And as I mentioned before, Alterna, we look at credit scores that ranges anywhere from 650 and above to get loans over $5,000. We look at personal income here under the 50,000 mark. And of course, they would need to operate that full-time, part-time, seasonal, or legal business. We would need to see a detailed business plan 12 to 24 months, cash flow projections, notice of assessment, references, photo identification, business registration. If you notice here, we're not asking for financial statements because these businesses are in the startup phase. So we're asking for projections or forecasting. How much do you think the business is going to make? And we ask you to put that in a cash flow projections um, template.
The next is our Working Woman Business Loan, and this is primarily focused on women entrepreneurs. Um, they can borrow anywhere from $1,000 up to $25,000 here. And if you look at some of the requirements to qualify, credit scores are 650 and above to go up to the maximum of $25,000. We look at personal income under the 50K mark. Um, as well, we want to see that the woman entrepreneur have majority ownership in her business and how we determine that she would need to have 51% ownership of her business. So meaning that she can have a partner. Um, however, if she has uh, and the partner is male, she will have to show that she have owner, majority ownership in that business. Now, we also look at if the woman entrepreneur is applying to the maximum of 25,000, that she has some, um, the business has, already has generated revenue and we look at revenue generation for at least one year or more. If um, the woman entrepreneur hasn't generated every, any revenue as yet, the business is just in the startup phase, we look at loans up to $15,000. This will allow the woman to start building that um, revenue generation history, and then she can apply up to the maximum of $25,000. We will ask for a detailed business plan, 24 months cash flow projection. If the business is already generating revenue, we're going to ask for the revenue information, such as financial statements. Um, we're going to ask for business registration documents, uh, most recent notice of assessment, references, photo identification information. And finally, we have our... Um, social impact entrepreneurship loan. Um, this loan is for whether an individual is a sole proprietor partnership, corporation, they're operating a non-for-profit organization or a co-op, but they're, they're um, operating a social purpose business, meaning that business have to have a social mission, social mandate um, in order for their business to operate. They can borrow here up to $25,000. To qualify, they would need to be 18 years or older, have a credit score of 650 and above to get up to the maximum of 25,000. Um, if they're not income generating, we look at loans up to $15,000 for this particular program. Um, we also look at, you know, if they have board minutes um, to support the borrowing under this program as well. So we would need a motion from their board of directors. Um, and some of the documentation that is required, a detailed business plan, 24 months cash flow projections, revenue to date, um, business registration document, notice of assessment from the owners, references, photo identification information. What so we quick question on yeah. that last one there, Jean. So um, if if you are um, applying as a part of a, a corporation or a, a, as a nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, are you applying as an individual or are you applying in terms of that entity that or that arrangement that you have? So you're applying, it's both. So you're applying under the entity, but we look at the owners that own that entity, especially if the, the business or that non-for-profit entity doesn't have any credit history or business credit history. It's brand new. There's nothing there to support it. So we look at the owners that run the company, run those organizations. And those are the individuals that we look at because there's no history. Okay, thank you. Um, we typically lend for these six um, reasons. So we want the entrepreneur to let us what the purpose of the loan is, what is the intention of them borrowing the funds to, you know, have the business sort of help to operate. Um, so we always see working capital, fixed assets, leasehold improvement, business expenses such as promotional material, doing marketing, doing advertising, um, buying supplies, buying inventory. We look at 
um, they let us know there's business expansion. So an individual who wants to go from, you know, running a home-based business, now you want to go into an office or a storefront. Um, and then other, well, um, they're looking to um, hire employees, hire staff. We want you to let us know how you're going to use those funds that the, these money will allow your business to be fully operational and that your business can start generating a business um, revenue, business income. There are three assessment criteria that we look at when an application come forth. We wanna see that you submit a business plan, which includes cash flow projections. We wanna see that the entrepreneur has the skill set to you know, make that business a success. Um, and then the individual or the entrepreneur um, can demonstrate their credit character worthiness. So we want to see that, you know, they can manage their credit really well. And that's where we will perform um, that credit um, sort of inquiry to look at how the individual or the entrepreneur manage their overall credit. Because that will paint a picture to allow us to see that you're going to be managing your business credit um, responsibly as well. And I'll just so put in my, our little plug here at the BBPA. Um, we are available to help individuals and businesses with that business plan so you're ready um, to go to Alterna or any other financial institution for um, accessing loans. So uh, the BBPA, you can check us at bbpa.org or just give us a call to arrange um, us helping you with that business plan. Yeah, and that business plan is really key because most lenders want to see that, you know, the business has actually taken the time to, you know, research, develop, create business plan, know all the sort of ingredients or the components of your business. Um, and so we know that you have a good understanding, a good grasp of your business operations. So it's really important to take advantage of those, um, you know, programs that BBPA offer. So some of um, just a highlight of our processes or micro loan ranges from a thousand up to 25,000, depending on the different programs that entrepreneurs apply under. We look at loan criteria, depending on the amount of the loan, the type of business structure, the personal credit scores, and other supporting documentation. We look at interest rates from prime plus two up to prime plus six. That's how we determine what the interest rates for the loan is. So, you know, we talk about credit scores in the 700. If your credit score as an entrepreneur is in the 700 or the high ranges of that, you know, individual, the entrepreneur has an opportunity of getting credit at prime plus two. Prime currently right now sits at 5.95% and prime is always subject to change by the Bank of Canada. We have a, a admin fee of $100 or repayment term ranges from one to five years. The average um, term is three years to repay the micro loan back or loan payments are scheduled on a monthly basis. So the loan will start be, um, be, being repaid 30 days after the individual signed the um, loan and the loan funds are dispersed. And then entrepreneurs that go through the program have an opportunity to participate in our micro savings program. So this program um, allows individuals or entrepreneurs who are running the business, if they're paying down their business debt, their micro loan, they're building up their savings as well. Because we see that a lot of business entrepreneurs don't save um, for their business. And this program allows them to build up their savings in the event there's an emergency or they may unable to tap into further credit. They have the business savings that they can utilize. Okay. So quick question on that last slide there, uh, Jean. So the prime right now set by the uh, the Bank of Canada is uh, 5.95, five, five. yes. Right. So is that then the interest rate that is prime that you could offer or is it still, or does the institution, it, it can't move from that Bank of Canada in terms of the rates that they set, correct? Correct. So 
all banks, whether we're credit unions or big banks, we follow what Bank of Canada set the interest rate. Um, and if you think about it, earlier, early this year, like January, February, Prime was at 2.70. Bank of Canada has made six interest rate increase change and they're looking to um, do another increase in December. So Prime is set to go up again. We don't know how much points Prime is gonna go up, but all banks follow when the Bank of Canada change um, the Prime rate. And then that's when Prime is set. And then we as financial institutions set our lending rates based on Prime. Right. Under the micro loan program, or loan program is based on prime plus two up to prime plus six. So we can see an application come into us, but the individual have a credit score say lower than 650. However, but they have a good and viable business and everything else in the application process fits. We can then extend credit to that individual. However, they're gonna get an interest rate of prime plus six, which would be 11.95%. However, on the other side, we can see an applicant comes in and they have a beacon score, say of 799. They can have an opportunity of getting a, a interest rate if everything fits when we look at the whole application of prime plus two, which is at 7.95%. So that's how we determine what the interest rate for a particular loan that the entrepreneur is applying for um, based on their personal credit scores. Right. And if that interest rate was fixed um, prior to the, uh, the Bank of Canada increasing, it would still remain at that rate until it had to be renegotiated, re correct? So this is a loan. this is a variable variable interest rate, meaning that when prime changes, the prime rate will change. The two percent is fixed. So prime is variable, and the two percent is fixed. Will that mean and that equals this is a variable rate interest loan? All of our loans are unsecured, so we don't ask for any collateral or any security to support our micro loans. Okay. All right. Um, also want to talk about uh, another opportunity in our microloan program. We have a co, um, a joint co-lending program with BDC. Um, where uh, individuals, if they meet three criteria, so black entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, and woman entrepreneur, they have an opportunity of applying up to 25,000. If they're approved under the Alterna program, they will have an opportunity to get a matching loan through BDC for 25,000 with a potential of getting a total $50,000 in loan. So, sorry, if they go through our program, um, and they're a social entrepreneur, woman entrepreneur, black entrepreneur, and they get approved for 25, they can get an additional approval of 25, which will total um, 50,000. Um, please go to the information on the website to get more information. Also, I will put my um, email and information at the end in the chat. So if anyone is interested, you could reach out to me. We can have a conversation on that as well. We also have our Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund through the FACE organization, Alterna Savings, along with a credit union in BC, which is Van City, does the micro loan segment of this loan. So individuals who apply under the Black Entrepreneurship Program will have an opportunity to apply up to $25,000 here. So that's where I would recommend for individual to apply. Um, they can get loans anywhere from 10,000 up to 25,000. The interest rate is prime plus three. Um, terms are up to, repayment terms are up to five years. There is an interest only option for the loan. There is an admin fee of $100. Um, and they would need to apply through FACE. So they would go to facecoalition.com slash en to submit their application here for this program. Once they go through the FACE um, program, FACE will then make a recommendation to Alterna for us to do the final adjudication of that loan. 
um, and they can get up to 25,000. And then if they require more money, they can then move on to the BDC portion where they can get an additional $25,000. So this is really important. And those are the options out there for individuals applying. Right. Another quick question here then. So regardless of your credit score um, for this Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund in conjunction with FACE, um, mm -hmm. is it 3% no matter what, or is it just starting at 3% in terms of a 3% right. plus prime? So FACE requirement for this program that uh, the entrepreneur has a beacon score of 600 and above. So it's different from the Alterna program. You would have to have a credit score of 600 and above to apply for the FACE program. And you can apply up to $25,000 here under the microfinance. However, FACE does look at large lending as well. If you go on their website, you will see that they do loans up to um, $250,000 if that's what the entrepreneur is looking for. But your minimum requirement um, credit score to have is 600 for this program. And then you right. can apply. All right. And uh, just a quick question from the chat. So they just wanted to confirm that these loans are not available to federal registered businesses located in Quebec. Is that correct? Uh, FACE has a program with Quebec, so you would have to go on the FACE website to see loans that um, are for Quebec and the institution, the financial institution that um, sort of serve um, the Quebec region. Go to the FACE program and um, that information is reported there. All right, thank you. And finally, I just want to end with, you know, Entrepreneurs that come through a program and they're approved, whether it's through the Alterna in-house micro program or through FACE, um, they, we offer what we call our micro business banking package, which um, gives some benefits to entrepreneurs when they're starting up, you know, you're running a business, you know, there's some day-to-day -day operation, and there's some key things that we offer with this program, and I just want to share with everyone. So you get a business banking package with no monthly fee. Um, we offer um, personal um, basic banking checking account, so the individual will both need to have their business banking account and their personal banking account with us. They would need to be enrolled in our micro savings program. They have an opportunity to get a business credit cards. We offer payment process services, which is merchant services as well. We partner with Staples. So if someone is uh, an entrepreneur is looking for space to run meetings, office space, um, when you get this business, um, micro business banking package is include all of these service offering um, to entrepreneurs. So very fantastic program um, for individuals to be enrolled in. And, you know, this is just some information about the, stu um, the Staples Studio offering that what comes with that. So they have access to staple location, five hour free access to a virtual assistant, um, and just a lot of information and services that is offered here. So just really fantastic offering that we um, provide to our entrepreneurs. And we're at the end. I want to thank you so much. And do we still have, Roger, do we still have time for some questions? Yes. I can, got, I can feel that as well. Definitely so. Um, somebody asked if you could uh, put up that previous slide one more time. Which, which one? I guess the one right before this. Uh, this one? I am assuming that may be it. Yeah. All right, but questions for Jean Barrett from Alterna Savings. Great presentation this morning, Jean. You're welcome. Any more questions? But you know, the key thing, how I set up the presentation, I wanted to talk about credit because credit is really important. And you want to ensure that before you go to any financial institution, the one before, okay. um, sorry, let me just go. I was... I was in the chat, so that's the one. Um, you wanna ensure that you understand and you know where your credit sits. 
right? Because I think in our community, a lot of time when we go into the bank and we apply and we get turned down or decline, it, 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 it's a negative sort of impact on us. It, you know, it impacts our confidence. It impacts our self-esteem. We don't want to deal with that particular institution anymore. But if you are armed with the information that you know your what's on your credit report, you are the best advocate in getting that credit, getting that loan. You can have a discussion, a conversation with that lender because you know where things sit. So looking at your credit, even though it's one piece of the puzzle of becoming an entrepreneur, you know, it plays an important role when you're, when you're looking for credit. All right. I'm so going to put my questions. information in the chat while I feel that. But yeah, one. you could probably uh, go back to your information so that people could take a screenshot uh, with your information. So if you wanted to access Jean, um, you can, you know, take that screenshot and then give her a call or an email. So if you wanted just to go back to that last uh, slide yeah. there, Gene, your information. But Will two do. quick questions here. So is there a timeline to use the loan if it is approved from Alterna? So there is a timeline to use the loan. Once the funds are in your account, you have access to it. You can use the account for your business purposes. You will get um, a term which is the length of time it will take you to repay that loan back. And typically we look at anywhere from one to five year, the average is three years. Um, and we look to see that that information is forecasted or it projected in your cash flow projections under the expense section. So under the expense, in, expense section in your cash flow, you should allocate this is how much I'm gonna pay for my loan every month. Um, and we wanna see that. This is how much my business is gonna make. These are all my expenses, which include my loan payments, um, any credit card payments. And we need to see that information in your business plan, in your cash flow projections. Right. I'm sorry. No problems. And um, there's a question here also. So is uh, a score of 800 possible? Can one achieve oh, this without? Yes taking out a major loan or a mortgage. And actually for somebody who's just mm -hmm. getting into, uh, I guess, um, the, 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 the lending or, or having a mortgage, do you start out with 800 if your credit is not tarnished? Yeah, yeah. all great questions. So one cannot achieve the 800 score without borrowing. So you have to borrow, meaning that you have to apply for something you've then now been approved, you have access to it, you use it, meaning you utilize it, you pay it every month. That will help you to generate the credit score. If you've not applied for anything, you don't have a credit history, you don't have a credit report, you don't have credit score. So now somebody, I think, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, if someone, if you don't apply for credit, you don't have credit history, you don't have a credit score. So you always have to apply. My recommendation is to get maybe a small credit card, use that credit card, pay it off, use it maybe once every month or once every three months. That creates activity, it creates a history, and it helps to build your credit score. Because I think it was Audia that also said, sometimes if you have credit and you don't use it, it can be canceled. It will not generate information or a credit score for you. You have to use the credit in order to generate the credit score. If you don't borrow, you will not have any credit history. All right. So finally, we have- There's a, a hand up. Juliet. And that should be the last question for Jean for the day. Good morning, Juliet. Hello again. Thank you so much. Here's a question for you, um, Jean. What was there anything that could be arranged uh, under the Black Entrepreneurship Programs right across the board in regards to because we talked about the the inquiries on the credit bureau and how much it can scale off a person's um, beacon score. 
So is there any way that something could be arranged that when the banks under that program go and uh, retrieve uh, inquiries on the individual or the company, it does not impact their credit score per se mm -hmm. to the point where they're now not having that re prerequisite requirement for the amount that you're looking for the credit score that you're looking for? That's a great question, but how the program was designed, um, a credit, so there's, when someone, when a credit is pulled, there's what's called a hard pull and a soft pull. Yes, right. A hard pull is when your credit scores get impacted. You get, you get that inquiry, those 10 points gets taken off your credit score, and then what's called a soft pull. Soft pull meaning that nothing happens to your credit score. Now, how the Black Entrepreneurship Program was designed, your, it's a hard pull by all the institutions that look at your credit. So whether if you apply under the microloan uh, program, um, when the application comes to us or Van City, we have to do a hard pull. And, or if you, you apply for higher amounts and it goes to the banks or BDC, they do a hard pull. They don't do a soft pull. Now, you can have a conversation with Faith to see if they when they pull your credit because they have to a part of their processes they have to determine whether or not you move from the different stages so they have to look at a, the entrepreneur credit score and i don't and i'm not sure if they do a hard pull or a soft pull but you can ask the question so you know that's what i'm saying you can always ask questions to the creditor or the individual or the organization that you are applying to. Do you do a hard pull? Do you do a soft pull? Right? If it's a hard pull and you're applying, you have to just ensure that you can meet that requirement. And I know under the Black Entrepreneurship Program, the, um, the minimum credit score is 600 that the entrepreneur has to have to ensure that they move forward in the process. But you can certainly ask the question. I'm not sure if FACE does a, a hard pull or a soft pull, but I do know when the applications come to Alterna, we do a hard pull. Thank you. All right. And on that note, we just wanted to say thank you very much again to our guest, this morning, Jean Barrett from Alterna Savings. Thank you very much, Jean. It was um, incredible in terms of the information uh, that you shared, and we definitely would love to have you come back just to continue the, the conversation and the dialogue that we have here on Community Space every uh, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Rod, for having me out. And thanks, BBPA. And I always like to say, do your research, research, research. Have conversations before you make a decision to borrow. Thank you very much. And although uh, we are wrapping up Financial Literacy Month, it is always Financial Literacy Month here at the BBPA. And we encourage you to become involved and in, engulf in, in yourself in terms of learning because learning is an activity that never stops. So we look forward to seeing you next week here on Community Space, the financial literacy program that speaks the language of the community. So join us here at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time here in the same space on Community Space. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Peace out. Thank you very much to our sponsors, RBC and the Donald Reed Estate, and definitely so the BBPA. Thank you. Take care. Community Spaces, the financial literacy program that speaks and reaches the community. Are we going to be in a better place or are we going to be still, quote unquote, behind the eight ball? Because of the historical disadvantage that our community has, we most times do not have financial role models. Without that, economically and financially speaking, we'll always be at the bottom. Keep 
proper books and records because the data drives the strategy and the strategy drives the profits. COVID-19 sort of removed a veil. It's really exposed the structural barriers that our communities face. These last two years where there's been a heightened emphasis on the well-being of Black people has influenced the influx of funds and opportunities. The time is now. How long is that window going to be open? We'll see you next week. And don't forget to tell a friend to tell a friend to join us here on Community Space.